Hi, my name is Miss Judy. I'm a foster grandparent in Guilford. I taught for 30 years, and during that time, this became my favorite book. This is a book about Miss Rumpheus, who is in search of finding the most beautiful thing to leave in the world. So I would like to share this book with you now. And we can do the sharing. And so now I'm going to read, just read or show the pictures. You tell me. Because here is, here is the picture that shows mm -hmm. of the lupins. This book is Miss Rumpheus by Barbara Cooney. Barbara Cooney wrote many books about the Maine coast and she is no longer with us now, but her books are wonderful. If you're ever looking for a book that you'd like to read, she not only wrote, but she illustrated them. And this book is written and illustrated by her, Barbara Cooney. The Lupin Lady lives in a small house overlooking the sea. In between the rocks around her house grow blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. The Lupin Lady is a little old, a little and old, but she has not always been that way. I know, because she is my great aunt, and she told me so. Once upon a time, she was a little girl named Alice, who lived in a city by the sea. From the front stoop, she could see the wharfs and the bristling masses of tall ships. Many years ago, her grandfather had come to America on a large sailing ship. Now, he worked in a shop at the bottom of the house, making figureheads for the prows of ships and carving Indians out of wood to put in front of cigar stores. For Alice's grandfather was an artist. He painted pictures too of sailing ships and places across the sea. When he was very busy, Alice helped him. She put the skies in the pictures. In the evening, Alice sat on her grandfather's knee and listened to his stories of faraway places. When he had finished, Alice would say, When I grow up, I too will go to faraway places, and when I grow old, I too will live by the sea. That is all very well, little Alice, said her grandfather, but there is a third thing you must do. What is that, asked Alice. You must do something to make the world more beautiful, said her grandfather. All right, said Alice, but she didn't know what that could be. In the meantime, Alice got up and washed her face, ate her porridge for breakfast. She went to school and came home and did her homework. And pretty soon, Alice grew up. Then my grand great aunt Alice set out to do the three things she had told her grandfather she was going to do. She left home and went to live in another city, far away from the sea and the salt air. There she worked in a library, dusting books and keeping them from getting mixed up and helping people find the ones they wanted. Some of the books told her about faraway places. Miss Rumpheus was what she was called now. Sometimes she went to a conservatory in the middle of the park. When she stepped inside on a wintry day, the warm, moist air wrapped itself around her, and the sweet smell of jasmine filled her nose. This is almost like a tropical isle, said Miss Rumpheus, but not quite. So Miss Rumpheus went to a real tropical island where people kept cockatoos and monkeys as pets. She walked along beaches, picking up beautiful shells. One day she met the Bapa Raja, king of the Vishy village. You must be tired, he said. Come into my house and rest. So Miss Rumpheus went in and met the Papa Raja's wife. The Bapa Raja himself fetched a green coconut and cut it off the top so that Miss Rumpheus could drink the coconut water inside. Before she left, the Baba Raja gave her a beautiful mother of pearl shell on which he had painted a bird of paradise and the words, you will always remain in my heart. You will always remain in mine too, said Miss Rumpheus.
My great aunt, Miss Alice Rumpheus, climbed tall mountains where the snow never melted. She went through jungles and across deserts. She saw lions playing and kangaroos jumping. And everywhere she made friends, she would never forget. Finally, she came to the land of the lotus eaters. And there, getting off a camel, she hurt her back. What a foolish thing to do, said Miss Rumpheus. Well, I have certainly seen faraway places. Maybe it's time for me to find my place by the sea. And it was, and she did. From the perch of her new house, Miss Rumpheus watched the sun come up. She watched it cross the heavens and sparkle on the water, and she saw it set in the glory in the evening. She started a little garden among the rocks and surrounded her house, and she planted a few flower seeds on the stony ground. Miss Rumpheus was almost perfectly happy. But there is still one thing I have to do, she said. I have to do something that will make the world a more beautiful place. But what? The world already is pretty nice, she thought, looking out over the ocean. The next spring, Miss Rumpheus was not very well. Her back was bothering her again, and she had to stay in bed most of the time. The flowers she had planted the summer before had come up and bloomed in spite of the stony ground. She could see them from outside her bedroom window, blue and purple and rose-colored. Lupins, said Miss Rumpheus. I have always loved lupins the best. I wish I could plant more seeds this summer so that I could have still more flowers next year. But she was not able to. After a hard winter, spring came. Miss Rumpheus was feeling much better. Now she could take walks again. One afternoon, she started to go up and over the hill, where she had not been in a long time. I don't believe my eyes, she cried when she got to the top. There, on the other side of the hill, was a large patch of blue and purple and rose-colored lupin. It was the wind, she said to herself as she knelt in delight. It was the wind that brought the seeds from my garden here, and the birds were helpful too. Then Miss Rumpheus had a wonderful idea. She hurried home and got out her seed catalogs. She sent off to every best seed house in five, for five bushels of lupin seeds. All that summer, Miss Rumpheus, her pockets filled with seeds, wandered over the fields and headlands sowing lupins. She scattered seeds along the highways and down the country lanes. She flung handfuls of them around the schoolhouse and back of the church. She tossed them into the hollows and along stone walls. Her back did not hurt. Now some people call her the crazy old lady. The next spring, there were lupins everywhere. Fields and hillsides were covered in the blue and purple and rose-colored flowers. They bloomed along the highways and down the lanes. Bright patches lay around the schoolhouse and back of the church. Down in the hollows along the stone walls grew the beautiful flowers. Miss Rumpheus had done the third and most difficult thing of all. She had done something that made the world more beautiful. My great aunt Alice Rumpheus is her very old now. Her hair is very white. Every year there are more and more lupins. Now they call her Lupin Lady. Sometimes my friends stand with me outside her gate, curious to see the old, old lady who planted the fields of lupins. When she invites us in, they come slowly. They think she is the oldest woman of the world. Often she tells us stories of faraway places. When I grow up, I tell her, I too will go to faraway places and come home and live by the sea. That's all very well, little Alice, says my aunt, but there is a third thing you must do. What is that, I ask? You must do something to make the world more beautiful. All right, I say. But I do not know yet what that can be. The end. Hello, 
My name is Patty. I am with the Foster Grandparent Program. I go by Nini to my grandchildren, so you can know me as Nini as I read you this story. And the book is called Keep Love in Your Heart, Little One. It's by Giles Andre, and it's illustrated by Clara Volume. Volume. Keep love in your heart, little one. One evening, long after my sleep time, Big softly crept to my bed and stretched out warm fingers to ruffle my hair. I love you, my darling, Big said. Now Big must have thought I was sleeping, and I didn't open an eye. Instead, I just let the words float through my mind like balloons floating up through the sky. I love you, my small, Big continued, but there's so much to do in the day that it's hard to sit down and to make enough time to say all of the things I should say. And it's funny, but now that you're sleeping and everything's quiet and calm, the words seem to be much more easy to speak. And Big laid a soft hand on my arm. You're everything I always dreamed of. You've got so much beauty inside. The way that you smile, that you laugh, that you dance, makes my heart want to sing out with pride. You live as though life's one huge present, unwrapping a bit every day. That's just how we all should be living, my love. And look at you showing the way. And sometimes, I know when I scold you, you feel that I'm being unfair. But please understand that it's just out of love and Big swept back a strand of my hair. There are things in this life that can hurt you. They come to us all, that I know. But they all give us chances to learn, darling small. And they all give us chances to grow. So, when you get knocked down, my sweetheart, look up at the sky without fear. For sometimes we need to be flat on our backs before starlight begins to appear. And please, above all else, remember, keep love in your heart, little one. Reach out to the world like a beautiful flower stretches out to the warmth of the sun. It's the only sure way to be happy, the only sure way to be free. Believe in yourself and believe in your dreams and you'll be what you dream you can be. At last, Big lay down on my pillow and planted a kiss on my head. My beautiful, wonderful, glorious child, you light up my world, Big then said. With that, Big crept out of my bedroom, turning round for one last little peep. I hugged my small pillow and smiled a big smile and then slowly, I drifted to sleep. And that's the story of Keep Love in Your Heart, Little One. So believe in yourself. I hope you enjoyed the book as much as I did. Hi, my name is Miss Rose, and I'm here to read you a story. The name of the story is If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And it's written by Laura Jaffe Numeroff and it's illustrated by Felicia Bond. Okay. okay, and here we go. If you give a mouse a cookie. And then we'll go to the next page. And it says, if you give a mouse a cookie, there he is. He's going to ask you for a glass of milk. When you give him the milk, he's going to ask you, he'll probably ask you, for a straw. When he's finished, he'll ask for a napkin. Then he'll want to look in the mirror to make sure he doesn't have a milk mustache. When he looks into the mirror, he might notice that his hair needs a trim. So he'll probably ask for a pair of scissors. Mm. 
fancy little mouse, huh? Okay, when he's finished giving himself a trim, he'll want to sweep up. He'll start sweeping, he might get carried away and sweep every room in the house. He even may even end up washing the floors at well as well. When he's done, he'll probably want to take a nap. Oh brother. You'll have to fix up a little box for him with a blanket and a pillow. He'll crawl in and make himself comfortable and fluff the pillows a few times. He'll probably ask you to read him a story. So you read to him from one of your books and he'll ask to see the pictures. When he looks at the pictures, he'll get so excited, he'll want to draw one of his own. He'll ask for paper and crayons. There he goes. He'll draw a picture. See all the crayons? And then... When the picture is finished, he'll want to sign his name. He'll sign it with a pen. Then he'll want to hang his picture on your refrigerator, which means he'll need... Sorry. Which means he'll need scotch tape. He'll hang his drawing and stand back and look at it. Looking at the refrigerator will, mind, will remind him that he's thirsty. So, let's see what happens. He'll ask for a glass of milk. And chances are, if he asks for a glass of milk, he's going to want a cookie to go with it. That's it. And that's the end of the story. Hello, I'm going to read you a book, Dear Girl. And it's written by Amy Krause Rosenthal and Paris Rosenthal. Keep that arm raised. You, you're, you have smart things to say. Dear girl, sometimes you may feel like being pink and sparkly. Sometimes you may feel pretty much the opposite. Look at yourself in the mirror and say thank you to something that makes you, you. Thank you, freckles. Thank you, birthmark. Thank you, red hair. Dear girl, sometimes you just need a good cry. Sometimes you'll need a friend. Sometimes you'll need to be alone. Sometimes you'll need a tissue. Sometimes you'll need a bucket. Dear girl, did you know there is no such thing as asking too many questions? Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Dear girl, write down your thoughts once in a while, even if it's just to enjoy the way your pen feels against the paper. Dear girl, make your room awesome. Make your room you. Dear girl, don't ever lose your sense of wonder. Dear girl, sometimes you've just got to stop and dance. Dear girl, find people like you. Find people unlike you. Dear girl, create traditions Fun, crazy handshakes and silly inside jokes. 
Dear girl, if your instinct is telling you to say no, say no, you know. Dear girl, coloring outside the lines is cool too. Dear girl, there are no rules about what to wear or how to cut your hair. Dear girl, gosh, I don't know, I've got this. Listen to the brave side. I think I skipped a page. Dear girl, you know what's really boring <clears throat> when people say, how bored they are. Dear girl, you won't invite, you won't be invited to every single party on the planet, which is really okay. Can you imagine how exhausting that would be? Dear girl, a tree trunk is the perfect place for quiet thoughts to thunk. Dear girl, Whenever you need an encouraging boost, remember you can turn to any page in this book. Most of all, dear girl who I love, know that you can always, always, always turn to me. The end. Uh, hello, I'm Miss Pat uh, with the Grandparent uh, uh, Friends Program. And the book that I'm going to read to you is called The Snowiest Christmas by Jane Chapman. The snowiest Christmas ever. It was almost Christmas and the bear's cabin twinkled with decorations. All around the tree, presents waited to be unwrapped and the fire cracked cozily. Everything was perfect except for one thing. Please let there be snow this Christmas squeaked button, pointing at her book. Oh, yes, Mongo cried, all fluffy and soft for Santa's sleigh to land in. Papa laughed. Don't worry, cubs. I'm sure snow is on the way. But there was no snore snow at bath time. Then at bedtime, something twinkled against the window. Button took a peek. It's snowing, grass Button. Yay, cheered Mongo. Papa gave his excited bears a squeeze. I wish it would snow forever, Button yawned sleepily. And all through the night, the snow got deeper and deeper and deeper. The next morning, something big fell through the mail slot. Plop! It was a mound of snow. Ooh, Button whispered. Oh my, explained Papa. I've never seen snow do that before. Snowball fight, cheered Mongo, haul, hauling a paw, a paw full of button at Button. Squealing, Button aimed one back, but her snowball hit Papa instead. Why don't you play outside, chuckled Papa. I'll make breakfast. But when the cubs opened the door, an avalanche of white tumbled in, flop. Wow, who? I got a great idea, grinned, Mo grinned Mo Mongo, and he began to roll a snowball of snow around the floor. The snowball grew and grew. We need a carrot, Papa, called Mongo. For breakfast, replied Papa. And no, it's for the snowman, laughed Button. Oh my, an indoor snowman? Let's clean this up before he melts into an enormous puddle, explained Papa. The snowflakes drifted down all day long. More snow, more snow, sang the bear cubs. Just then there was a rumble from the chimney. Is that Santa already, asked Putton. Foof, a humongous pile of snow plunged down the chimney and the fire went out. Oh no, grasped Papa. Now, this really is too much snow. If the chimney is blocked, how will Santa deliver our presents, Mongo cried. It's all my fault, sobbed Button. I wish it would snow, I wished it would snow forever. 
and now this has happened. Don't worry, Comfort Papa, gathering up Button and his uh, big bear paw will help Santa get through. We could use the broom Mongo suggested. Papa squeezed into the soddy uh, chimney and pushed the button up as far as he could. But even on tiptoe, he couldn't reach the top. So the bear cubs climbed onto Papa's shoulders and with a wiggle and a heave, the broom popped up. I can see stars, squeaked bu Button. Poof, chuckled Papa. I think we've saved Christmas. After a nice bath, the three bears cuddled by the fire. Are you sure Santa will come, mumbled Button? Of course, grinned Papa. The snow has stopped falling at last, and the forest looked as glittery as the pictures in Button's book. And while the bears slept soundly, Santa climbed down the chimney to leave them the perfect present. And guess what that was? A sled, cheered the bear, the bear cubs the next morning. Just right for the snowiest Christmas ever. Whee! And off they went. Thank you.